Hi everybody, this is Dr. Dale Guffey and this is your first video dealing with one of your particular chapters. And because it's the first one, let me give you a little bit of background here. For this class, I do these videos for every chapter that we cover or every reading assignment that we cover. And I find it's very useful to use these in addition to not replacing the PowerPoints that are provided. And while this is me pretty much just talking over the PowerPoints, it lets you have a good idea of the elements of the chapter that I emphasize, the elements that I think you can kind of skim. So what I suggest you do is watch the video with a copy of the PowerPoints, go ahead and print those out so that you can jot down notes. And if you have questions about anything, let me know. I cannot answer what you do not ask. And the law tends to be very dense and it can be kind of intimidating, especially in the beginning. And this first chapter, Miller is cramming so much into this first chapter that this is a little bit longer than most of the videos usually are. I try to keep them short. You do not have to watch them all in one sitting. If you prefer, watch a chunk, go get a cup of coffee, come back and watch another chunk. That's fine. But I think you will find that the videos are useful. So let's go ahead and dive into this. For this first one, look at everything he's trying to cover here. We're going to talk about the sources of American law because it's important to know where law comes from. That leads you into the common law tradition. We'll discuss constitutional powers of government, business, and the Bill of Rights, which really gets us into due process and equal protection. We talk about privacy rights, and then Chapter 1 also has an appendix that I want you to cover this week. It's relatively short, but it for one thing, it's a great lead in to the next chapter, which is going to deal with the structure of the court and alternative dispute resolution. But the appendix is really dealing with how you the different places you find the law and also how to analyze the law. Now, you already know about the Iraq system for analyzing the law and writing about the law from Appendix A in the text. And this appendix after Chapter 1 kind of folds in with it as well. So according to Miller, there are really five things we're trying to cover in this chapter. The, the four primary sources of law in the U.S., differences between civil and criminal law. A lot of people get confused on that one. What constitutional clause gives the federal government the power to regulate commercial activities among the various states? Please note, that's among the states, not within. Words really matter in the law. What's a Bill of Rights? What freedoms does the First Amendment guarantee? Which hopefully you can already rattle off to me right now. And last, where in the Constitution can the Due Process Clause be found? But there's a lot else that we're going to cover as we go through this. So let's go ahead and dive into the first one here, the sources of American law. You need to understand that there are two versions of this. There's a primary source of law. Think of it as a primary document. You know all about that. And a secondary source of law or a secondary document. Primary source of law is a document that establishes a law on a particular issue. That could be a constitution, it could be a statute, an administrative rule, or a court decision. All of those are considered primary. Secondary are publications that summarize or interpret the law. That's a typo. I'm sorry about that. That should be or interprets. Like a legal encyclopedia or an article in a law review, courts often will look at these secondary sources of law if it is an issue that hasn't come up before them in the past. We'll talk about how all that works. So one of the big ones here for us, of course, are constitutional law and statutory law. So constitutional law, this is law that's found in texts and cases that come from either federal, 
or state constitutions. And never ever forget, the US Constitution is the supreme law of the land. No government, be it state, local, agency, whatever, can have a law that violates the United States Constitution. You, you gotta have a hierarchy and in our country, the United States Constitution is at the very tippy top of that pyramid, okay? Statutory law is enacted by either federal and or state legislatures. You also have what are referred to as uniform laws, particularly the Uniform Commercial Code. That's a really big one in business. The UCC is something that we'll talk about and that gets discussed in more detail, obviously, within the text itself. But the idea behind the Uniform Commercial Code was that the business of America is business. And you had all these different jurisdictions that all had their own laws. And if you were trying to conduct business across state lines in different jurisdiction, it was hard to understand what the law would be. So uniform laws cover everything. They cover the country. Now, a uniform law is not... It's just hard to understand, so please look at the text. Uniform laws are drafted as models. They don't have the force of law until, of course, a legislature enacts them. Now, the UCC is a great example because it has been adopted, at least in part, by every state and territory of the United States. Louisiana, and you will learn about this when we get into a little more history in, the, in just a bit. Louisiana is weird. You can quote me on that. Louisiana did not adopt all the articles of the UCC. It's Louisiana. But the Uniform Commercial Code is at least in part the law because it's been adopted by all state legislatures, at least in part, okay? So statutory law, different from constitutional law, but has the same effect. In America, another important source is what we call administrative law. Now, these are rules, orders, and decisions of administrative agencies. The picture of the jet is there because the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, deals with aviation law. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency deals with environmental law. And as we all know, the IRS, Internal Revenue Service, deals with issues of tax law. And I use them as an example because if you don't think administrative law has the same effect and force as other sources of law, just try not paying your taxes. Keep in mind that's what Al Capone, the famous or infamous, I should say, gangster. He went to prison not for murder and racketeering. He went to prison for tax evasion. Pay your taxes. Case law and common law doctrines, okay. Not that hard to understand, but very important to understand. So, case law. These are the rules of law that are announced in court decisions. Case law interprets the statutes, the regulations, the Constitution, and sometimes other case law. This is why so much law comes from court decisions, all right? And this is tied into the common law tradition. In America, because the initial colonies were English colonies, we adopted an awful lot of English common law. Now, Louisiana we can get into because Louisiana was originally, go back to your high school history class, was originally a French colony. It went with French law. Interestingly enough, following the Louisiana Purchase, Louisiana did not give up French common law. So for the longest time, and continuing to today only to a lesser degree, the laws in Louisiana are actually really, really different. Case in point, 
Louisiana is the only state that is organized into parishes instead of being organized into counties. And it's a holdover from French common law, which Louisiana uses. This is all just to illustrate this. Okay, the common law, quote, is simply a term given to the body of general legal principles that was applied throughout the English empire. The original colonies were part of that English empire. The general legal principles included things like trial by jury and precedent. Precedent's gonna be really important. Little bit of Latin here, stare decisis. Okay, stare decisis is Latin for to stand on decided cases. Precedent is incredibly important. We want stability when it comes to court decisions. So a higher court's decision based on facts and law is binding on lower courts. This helps courts stay efficient. Like cases are going to be decided in like manners. Now, this is important for you to understand because when we get into civil and criminal, you have to, under, you have to understand precedent to understand why things happen the way they happen. And binding authority is going to become really useful to understand when you see the state versus the federal system and why you can have a case go through different systems and reach different conclusions. So legal stability is one of the things that we really, really go for. It doesn't mean that a court cannot overturn precedent. There are departures from precedent. Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 is a great example of the United States Supreme Court overturning itself. Brown overturned a decision called Plessy v. Ferguson, which was decided in the late 1800s. Plessy is where we got the hideous separate but equal doctrine. You can depart from precedent. Courts can do that, but they are loath to do it because we're going for legal stability. But courts are made up of people. People get things wrong. When there is no precedent, that gets interesting because then courts don't have precedent to look at. What they usually will then do is look at how other courts have decided the issue. We're always trying to be consistent. We don't always manage it, but that is the goal important to understand. So civil versus, or, or I'm sorry, substantive versus procedural law. We need to discuss that a little bit. Substantive law is law that defines, describes, regulates, and creates legal rights and obligations. Okay? Substantive law. Procedural law, on the other hand, deals with methods. Due process is procedural. Did they read you the Miranda rights before you were arrested and interrogated? Okay. Substantive, on the other hand, is dealing with the creation of the rights and the obligations. Procedural is enforcing those rights through, through um, methodology. Okay. The book then goes into um, a, a fair amount on these different distinctions of, of types of law, like civil versus criminal. Keep in mind, criminal is concerned with protecting the public against wrongful actions by punishment. Civil, on the other hand, is dealing with private rights, sometimes public rights as well, but not criminal, okay? It is possible for the same action to be both a criminal breach and a civil breach. We'll get into that more later. The O.J. Simpson murder case from the 90s is always a great example here of how the same action can give rise to two different lawsuits. They are different, okay? 
the state of California versus O.J. Simpson was a criminal case. Brown versus Simpson was a civil case. You have different parties. You have different, somewhat different procedures. You have different standards of proof, and you have different punishments, all of which we can get into um, a little bit later on, okay? National law deals with the laws of a particular nation as opposed to international law. This is where we're concerned primarily with things like treaties because you're dealing with relationships between nations. Okay, with all that in mind, let's move on to constitutional powers of government. And I am trying to go through this relatively quickly, but again, take breaks. You don't have to listen to the whole thing at once. We have a federal form of government. The federal constitution was a compromise. We originally had what were called the Articles of Confederation, and um, it didn't work. That's really safe to say. It just, it just didn't work. So the federal form of government was intended as a compromise, a political compromise, between folks who wanted the states to be sovereign and the folks who wanted a strong central government. Having just come out of a revolution, we were really wary of a strong central government, but we also understood that you could not have a country made up of 50 ununited states. Y you can't get anything done. So we have a federal form of government made up of three branches, and you know this. We have the legislative branch, we have the executive branch, and we have the uh, judicial branch, which is in charge of holding the other, each branch is in charge of holding the other two accountable, as far as that goes. Legislative branch can enact a law, but the executive branch can veto that law. Executive branch is responsible for foreign affairs, but treaties require consent from the Senate, which is part of the legislative branch. Congress determines the jurisdiction of federal courts. The president appoints federal judges with the advice and consent of the Senate, but the judicial branch can hold the other two branches' actions unconstitutional. So, ideally, each branch is keeping a sharp eye out on the other. Ideally, as you know and as you will learn, we don't always live in an ideal world. The United States Constitution, which is in your text as Appendix B, um, and honestly, if you haven't read the U.S. Constitution, especially, okay, especially if you've never read it, but, or if you haven't read it since like high school civics, I really, really encourage you to give that a read. Think of it as the owner's manual to the country, and it is shocking how many people have never read it. So in Article 1, Section 8, we have what is referred to as the Commerce Clause. Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. This is the clause that has the greatest impact on business than any other constitutional pr provision, any other at all, because it gives Congress a tremendous amount of power to regulate commerce. And what you learn very quickly in this class about the law is the power of words. What do we mean by commerce? If you are selling handmade jewelry on Etsy, is that commerce? If you are selling guns, is that commerce? Is it what you sell? Is it, what if you're not selling it? What if you're doing it through the barter system? Is that commerce? All of these things have come up. It's all about interpretation of the statute, which is, of course, the role of the judiciary. It's worth taking a look here at the case of Gibbons v. Ogden, which is an 1824 case. I know it's incredibly old, but this is how these things come up. So at the time, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court was Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall. And the definition was that commerce meant all business dealings that substantially affected, 
more than one state. And then you get into what's substantial. But the national government, due to this case, has the exclusive power, exclusive, to regulate interstate commerce. In other words, commerce that involves more than one state. It is worth taking a look here at a classic case, which is Heart of Atlanta Motel versus U.S. The owner of the Heart of Atlanta Motel, and look at the date. It is always important to look at the date, 1964. The owner of Heart of Atlanta did not want to uh, rent rooms to African Americans. And his whole thing was that his motel was not engaged in interstate commerce. It was of a, quote, purely local character. Take a look at this case. It's uh, a synopsis of it is listed in your textbook. And look at the facts as they line up. And I think you'll see the reasoning for the court. Because at issue here was, did the Civil Rights Act of 1964 violate the Interstate Commerce Clause? And the decision was a flat no, it did not. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was upheld as being constitutional. And again, if you take a look at this, this argument about it being purely local character, which was not the key argument, because even the court made it really clear, even if it was just a local motel, um, that didn't matter. It still affected interstate commerce. But it wasn't. It was accessible to state and interstate highways. The owner advertised nationally. He accepted convention trade, which came primarily from out of state. It's a really interesting case because it shows how the Civil Rights Act and commerce came together. We tend to not think of it that way. We tend to think of the Civil Rights Act as, I don't know, as, as being private, and I'm putting air quotes around that, as opposed to how it affects interstate commerce. Uh, I will say this, if you are unfamiliar with uh, the Green Book, that's a fascinating bit. Uh, the Green Book was published to let African Americans know where there were safe places to get gas, to stay overnight without being hassled, to eat in the, uh, throughout the Jim Crow South. It's fascinating, and I had never learned about it in school, so I try to pass these things along. So the Commerce Clause, all right? The Tenth Amendment, the last one in the Bill of Rights, reserves all powers to the state that haven't been delegated to the national government. The big thing there is it means states have inherent police powers. This includes the right to regulate health, safety, morals, general welfare, licensing, building codes, parking regulations, zoning restrictions, all of that falls under police powers, okay? That's important. It's not that the state doesn't have any rights. They do, but again, they can't conflict with the United States Constitution. There's also something called the Dormant Commerce Clause, National government has the exclusive power to regulate interstate commerce. States only have a dormant, which is a negative power, to regulate. Courts have to balance. And if you look at the, uh, the case in your book that's worth taking a look at, uh, it's not 2.3, I'm so sorry. It's case example 1.7 in your text, okay? the Trium Group versus Sharp, which uh, deals with some of these issues, and I think will bring that into focus for you a little bit. The Supremacy Clause, Article 6 of the United States Constitution, makes it really clear. The Constitution, the laws, and the treaties of the United States are the supreme law of the land. Federal law preempts. It takes precedent over conflicting state or local laws. State and local laws are great if they are filling in a gap, which is, uh, okay, look, 
so North Carolina, we have a state statute or a proclamation, what have you, that says that the cardinal is the state bird, and so help me, the plot hound is the state dog. Yeah, whatever. There's no conflict there, it, because it is not as if the federal government has said what the state bird or dog or what have you of North Carolina is. You can fill in the gap, but keep in mind, if it conflicts, federal law always wins, okay? Always, always, always. Uh, you can look at that in terms of congressional intent. There's a case example in your book that's 1.8, the Medtronic case from 08. Super fast. I promise I'm not going to read all this to you because you can do that and you have the PowerPoints. Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Keep in mind they were adopted all at once, or rather ratified all at once. And every last one of these has restrictions, okay? Notice, for example, by First Amendment, I put freedom of religion. There are actually five major freedoms covered under the First Amendment. Freedom of religion comes up... Um, frequently in cases, but it certainly is not the only thing that is covered in the First Amendment. Now, the Bill of Rights originally only applied to the federal government. Remember, there was that tension between state sovereignty and a strong central government. So originally, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government. Following the Civil War, there is a series of court cases where it, it is very clear that the Bill of Rights was, quote, incorporated and applied to the states as well. It is now settled law that no governmental entity, be that federal, state, local, whatever, no governmental entity can... Um, violate the Bill of Rights. All of it has been incorporated to governmental entities, okay? It, and honestly, that settled law. Every now and again, somebody will, will crop up, and you see it in the sovereign citizen movement, and yeah, I'm really putting air quotes around that one, who basically claims that s citizens aren't bound by the federal government. They are. Again, try not paying your taxes. So, let me look at the First Amendment with you real quickly because it does come up with business sometimes. Right to free speech is the basis of our democratic government. Political speech is especially protected. But free speech also includes what's called symbolic speech. Gestures, movement, articles of clothing. What so many people forget because they don't read carefully is that freedom of speech Speech, just like all of the uh, rights and privileges of the Bill of Rights, are subject to what are referred to as reasonable restrictions. Content neutral laws, that's the important thing. If you have certain uh, procedures, for instance, that you have to go through if you want to get a parade permit in Cleveland County, for example, because Cleveland County, governmental entity, you can't restrict someone getting that parade permit on the basis of what they're parading for or against, because the government's not going to get into the content. However, you can restrict it. You can say, look, you have to have porta potties, you have to have security. You have to put in your application 30 days before you want to have the parade. Those are content neutral. That's fine. You run into a real problem when you're trying to restrict the content. And the Morse v. Frederick case is, trust me, a weird one. But it illustrates the point. It really does illustrate the point. Um, I suggest you take a look at that. It, the book has, an, has uh, some information about it. 
It's case example 1.11. So take a look at that. As far as business is concerned, um, um, hold on, getting ahead of myself. Freedom of speech also includes corporate political speech and also commercial speech. We'll get to that in a minute. The Citizens United case from 2010 is probably one of the biggest decisions that dealt with corporate political speech. Political speech by corporations, including uh, political action committees, is protected by the First Amendment. I will be the first person to admit that I personally think the court got it wrong on Citizens United. Um, other people share my opinion on that, but there are plenty of people, and notably the Supreme Court, who disagrees with me on that. Um, it's an unsettled issue of how much protection. Everybody agrees that political speech is protected and that corporations have the right to political speech, but how far it goes is something that is not entirely settled yet. Commercial speech, courts give a lot of protection to commercial speech, which think of, think of this simply as advertising, okay? And again, it's because the business of America is business. The best example of that, and it's an older case, it's from 98, but is Bad Frog Brewery. New York wanted to prohibit the Bad Frog logo. Okay, they said that the logo was offensive. You can see a picture of it there, and it's a frog giving what can be described as an obscene gesture. Is it a reasonable restriction on commercial speech? The U.S. Court of Appeals, because it went there, it did not get all the way up to the Supreme Court. The New York Court of Appeals made it clear that a commercial speech limitation has to be, quote, part of a substantial effort to advance a valid state interest, not merely the removal of a few grains of offensive sand from a beach of vulgarity. It's a lovely way of putting it. But basically said, yeah, it is vulgar. It is um, in bad taste, and it's also protected. You don't have to like free speech. That's the thing. And at this point, it's a good place for me to introduce to you something you will hear me say again and again, which is change the facts, change the outcome. All right. What if Bad Frog Beer, what if it was using this logo not to market beer, but to market toys? Would that be different because your audience is different? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it totally would be. Everything is fact dependent. So you have to read the facts very, very carefully. Unprotected speech. Not everything is protected under freedom of speech. Obscenity is one of the big ones. Threats, lies, which include slander, defamation, libel. All of those are unprotected. But obscenity, this is the hard one, though. Because the definition is difficult. Defining what is obscene, because obscenity is not protected, versus what is simply, merely, in quotes, pornographic. Pornography is protected. I mean, you can go into any 7-Eleven and buy pornography if that's what you want to do. Heaven knows you can get it online. Obscenity is harder to pin down. What is clear is that sexual acts involving children are absolutely, totally, and incredibly reasonably prohibited as obscenity. Even if it is, quote, virtual child porn, which uses computer-generated images instead of actual people, people use technology for all kinds of wrong things. So freedom of speech freedom of religion. Interesting stuff here deals with, you have both the establishment clause, which we'll start with, and then the free exercise clause. 
the establishment clause says the government cannot establish a state-sponsored religion. The government also cannot enact a, a law that promotes religion or favors one religion over another, which, when you think about it, makes so much sense. Most of us do not have a whole lot of faith that the government can deliver our mail. And I say this as someone whose brother is a mailman. Do we really want the government choosing which religion people should be following? Um, it, it's, it's a mess. It's a snarly, snarly mess. It also has given rise to some really, really interesting laws about religious displays, such as nativity scenes on public property, on uh, crosses on public property. Keep in mind, this is only dealing with public property. Your own property, whatever. You want to put up 16 nativity scenes, and you want to put them up throughout the year, that's fine. That's your property. You get to do it. The Establishment Clause is dealing with public property that is held for all citizens. And that's why things get so terribly interesting. The Free Exercise Clause. This is where the government is prohibited from interfering with people's religious practices or forms of worship. But like everything else, there are some restrictions there. And there's some logical restrictions there, but the restrictions have to be necessary. And if a religious practice works against public policy and public welfare, the government can act. Um, some really interesting cases here come up involving Jehovah's Witnesses and Christian scientists, because those are faiths that do not believe in medical intervention and while adults are free to choose that, when it comes to children needing blood transfusions or children needing insulin, there have been some really, really heartbreaking cases. The parents are trying to do the best thing for the, for the sick child. The hospital wants to do the medically necessary thing for the sick child, and um, the conflict can be rather dramatic. Your textbook deals with uh, the case of Holt v. Hobbs, which deals with, with a prisoner. And there are a lot of interesting case law that comes out of prisons, including the incredibly famous case of Gideon, which dealt with uh, when you are entitled to an attorney if you are indigent. So I really recommend you take a look at Holt v. Hobbs because this is a Supreme Court decision on the free exercise clause and how restrictions on free exercise might be necessary. From there, and I know it's a long chapter. I said there was an awful lot in here. Let's get into due process real quickly, okay? Due process comes in two flavors, procedural and substantive. Substantive due process deals with the content uh, of the legislation, another typo, I'm sorry. That's the right itself, okay? Procedural due process means you have to have notice in a fair hearing before the government can take away your life, liberty, or your property. And these decisions obviously have to be fair. Um, I am going to try to speed this up a little bit. So by all means, check in the textbook a little bit, but due process comes up a lot, a lot. Equal protection, this is where we get into things like, okay, there, there are different levels, strict scrutiny, intermediate, and the, quote, rational basis test. They all feed into this idea of equal protection where the government has to treat similarly situated people or businesses in the same manner. If the rights being affected are fundamental, strict scrutiny is applied. It's a very, very high standard. If you're looking at discrimination based on gender, 
we use an intermediate test. Gender is not one of your protected classes going up into fundamental rights. Fundamental rights, um, race, religion, things that have been um, spelled out, okay, for a much longer period of time. The rational basis test comes up if you're dealing simply with economic rights. And there is a, um, a case there, 118 out of Kentucky, dealing with Maxwell's pick pack that will um, illustrate the, the concept pretty well for you. You also, in this chapter, get rather briefly into privacy rights. It's a fascinating topic, and I would love to give more time to it, but it'll do just to give you kind of a, a real brief overview here, okay? Olmsted v. United States in 1928 begins the idea that there is a constitutional protection of privacy. It is not spelled out specifically in the Constitution. The Constitution never mentions the word privacy. But you can read around the edges, which is what the court has done consistently. And it came up particularly in the Griswold case in 1965, which dealt with a married couple who wanted contraception. And uh, the state of Connecticut would not permit it. And the case hinged on a, uh, a right of personal privacy that was implied in the Constitution. This was famously expanded in the Roe v. Wade case in 1973. Although Roe has been eroded over the years, the basic principle of privacy is still um, enshrined in our law. And there are some federal privacy legislation that you ought to know about. The Freedom of Information Act, which dates all the way back to 1966. The Federal Privacy Act of 74. HIPAA in uh, the mid-90s. There's a huge deal about privacy legislation in uh, terms of medical information. Then you have the United States Patriot Act. This was passed in the wake of terrorist attacks on September 11th. It's been reauthorized twice in 06 and 11. And um, we gave up some things with that. Now, law is always a balancing act, always. Did we give up too much? I don't know. I, it's something that we can discuss and we can see where you fall. But uh, please make sure you've read the material before you start having this discussion, okay? From there, I'll only spend a few minutes on the appendix, but I do want to spend a few minutes there. The appendix to Chapter 1 is going to explain to you how to find and analyze the law. And statutory and administrative law, like the United States Code, state codes, in North Carolina, it's NCGS, North Carolina General Statutes, and administrative rules dealing with things like um, taxes, aviation. That's found in the Code of Federal Re Regulations, the CFR. How to find case law is discussed here. Keep in mind, most state trial court decisions aren't printed or published, but when you get up to the Court of Appeals and the state Supreme Courts, you find them in regional reporters. Uh, we're in the Southeastern Reporter, by the way. The, uh, ch the appendix will go over case citations for you. It, of a special interest is the National Reporter map. Federal court decisions can be found in uh, the United States Supreme Court decisions. Those are found in the U.S reports, which are just abbreviated U.S. Those are published by the federal government. There are a lot of unpublished opinions. You can usually access those through uh, online legal databases, particularly Westlaw. That's one of them. And every now and again, you get old, old cases. And citations there don't necessarily conform to the modern way because they're older cases. But from there, It'll also, the appendix also will go over 
after you've looked at all these different citations, and they are worth taking a look at. It'll go over things like case titles and terminology, um, who the parties are, who the judge and justices are, a decision and opinions. Pay some attention to that because it's not just the holding that's important. It's what are the concurring opinions? Who, who agreed with the decision but not with how they got there? What, what's going on in the dissenting opinion? There's some, always some great stuff in that. And the difference between, say, a plurality opinion and a per curiam opinion. Then there's a sample court case that breaks it down. And honestly, spend a little bit of time looking at that, okay? It's, it's worth it. It really, really is worth it. Okay, this video has gone on entirely too long. I apologize for that. But again, there is a lot in this first chapter. So that's chapter one. Again, do it in chunks, okay? All right, thanks. Bye.